agree. Thank you, Master. Yeah. Well, let me reshare the um, we are, session. We are at 1 p.m., so we are supposed to um, yeah. get started, Jane. So. We are. So let me um, share the session slides. Um, Curtis, I can roll with this if you'd like to intro the speakers, yeah? When we get ready. Sure, sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, hello, everybody in the room. We just want to thank you very much for attending um, Gaia at IETFI or TF119. Um, thank you to our host uh, there in Brisbane, and huge thanks to the APNIC Foundation. Wave at Sylvia, who's at the table in front of you. Sylvia, give him a wave. And there's Ritu, also, who's there with the APNIC Foundation. APNIC has helped bring um, folks to the IETF, and um, they've also been gracious enough to agree to help us up there um, at the table just in case something gets a little wonky. Um, you all um, should be uh, familiar with NoteWell from other meetings you've been in. I'm not going to read through it. The first time I did, people laughed at me. <laughs> so anyway, please do take note of the NoteWell, and please note really well. Um, and seriously, uh, there are certain uh, code of conduct. There's different um, uh, issues. You know, you're being recorded. Does everyone, if everyone's not aware of that, then you are. Um, so please just um, have a look uh, online if you need to. And please, if you will, make sure you've scanned the QR code um, so that you are logged in as a participant if you're not um, already. Here are some meeting tips. Um, you're probably very familiar with this by now, but just a heads up on that. Use of headset strongly recorded if you're online, um, just so that people can hear you well. And I assume uh, I did an audio check before, and Curtis did too, so I hope you can hear both of us, and we can hear Sylvia and Reed too. Resources for IETF Brisbane, uh, you're all aware of this by now because it's Tuesday, but here you go. And we have some great speakers who are going to speak uh, 20 minutes each. I'll help keep time on this end and uh, in the room, they'll help us with 10 minutes of Q&A. When we hit the Q&A, um, if you could keep your observations um, short and your questions short so that we can get in as many questions as possible. Over to you, Curtis. Yeah, with a light caveat on that, uh, as people who've been attending Gaia for a little bit, this is a small change to the format. Uh, we used to have 15 minutes with five minutes of questions, but um, we felt as though uh, basically uh, every single time we were like shoving people off of the mic. So we've switched to two uh, to 20 minutes um, with 10 minutes so that we have four speakers. Hopefully that'll go well, but I think everyone should feel free to open it up a little bit and try to have a little bit more discussion. Uh, that's an explicit goal of ours to create a little bit more space for that here. Um, I, I think uh, we're still working on flip slides though. He's posted them in the chat. Okay, I am going to um, stop sharing here and have a go there. See if you can load up, Phil. If you, uh, if you can't, I can share your old ones because the video may be tricky. I do have flip slides on my machine as well if we need to go that way. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no. I can share from the meeting side if we need to. I think we got them up now. Are we ready to roll? Yes. Who's, who, is that you sharing that, Jane? That is Jane. They were in the meeting. Like Jane. Okay. All right. I'd like to walk, welcome uh, Flip, um, who is an old colleague of mine. I haven't seen him in many years now, but um, has been moving on since being a grad student um, at the University of the Philippines to do uh, some stuff for, the, uh, for DOST. Uh, the science and technology organization uh, for the government of the Philippines. Uh, and I was really excited to hear more about what they've been doing with the RAIN project. And I got to say some really great acronyms. Um, I've been really, really excited about uh, you guys' ability to put together uh, really good project titles. So uh, Flip, go for it. Um, hi, and uh, good, um, af uh, good afternoon here in the Philippines. 
Um, I'm here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Curtis, Jane, and all to discuss this with you uh, regarding our project, uh, Resilient Education Information Infrastructure for the New Normal, or let's just call it RAIN for short. Uh, next slide, please. So um, a little bit more about our institute. We are called the Advanced Science and Technology Institute. We are a um, branch of the government that is tasked to perform research in um, ICT or in, uh, information and communications technology. So that's our goal, um, to perform research on R&D on um, ICT. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the overview is uh, I'll present you our project, uh, the context behind it. Um, some deployment updates and uh, ways to move forward. Next slide. So um, our project was born out of the pandemic, really, because um, we were one of, one of the countries that has shifted from uh, doing face-to-face -face physical um, classes in, in an abrupt shift to a remote um, online-based uh, setup. So we were tasked to, um, to uh, uh, deliver technology solutions that could aid some schools that are lagging behind because of the set setup uh, in order for them to uh, help have at least uh, have the benefits of having to uh, to perform uh, remote or online uh, learning setups no? and uh, we are also banking on the opportunity for us uh, because um, we have still to shift from analog to digital tv and when and if that happens there will be um, a portion of our frequencies that will uh, be vacated. And we were trying to uh, develop technology solutions using that frequencies in order for us to, um, to, uh, uh, to, um, to say to our lawmakers that to allot this uh, uh, slot of frequencies, uh, for example, for uh, mobile connectivity and uh, for other uh, needs. For example, uh, uh, our 600 megahertz spectrum we will, we will be vacated, some of it, and we are advocating to uh, to use that spectrum uh, for um, community networks and uh, all other alternative solutions uh, using LTE band 71, 4G, or if possible, 5G at 600, uh, 600 megahertz. And we are also exploring on um, non-internet-based solution using the same frequencies. Uh, we are exploring the data testing capability of the ISDBT standard, which we will be adopting. Um, we are performing some laboratory tests wherein we are um, we are delivering PowerPoint slides. We are delivering uh, delivering PDFs using our low um, power TV transmitter, and uh, we are trying to um, uh, set up that data carousel in a normal ISDBT broadcast, and we were able to do so. So, um, in the guise of a normal ISDBT test broadcast, we were able to carry. Um, a limited amount of uh, of uh, of a document for a, a PDF, for example. Um, uh, we are also um, uh, uh, this, uh, we are also delivering um, on-premise cache content to optimize the usage of internet in these areas. For example, in areas where uh, the only solution would be satellite internet, and it is very expensive. So we are. Uh, we are creating this some kind of uh, walled garden wherein we are partnering with, with content providers in order for us to host the content in the uh, premises so that uh, they would have less reasons to uh, to use the internet uh, for some if, if for example if uh, the educational materials are already are already on premise then um, they don't have to uh, search for the internet for the needed resources. And the core technology of this, uh, be because we are um, targeted towards education, uh, the, to the core technologies could also be used uh, for other cross-cutting um, sectors, for example, in disaster risk um, reduction, tourism, etc. So next slide. So um, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we would uh, we um, for a lack of a better word, uh, we had some challenges with our regulator. For example, we were prohibited to um, to have a public demonstration of the use of 600 megahertz LTE um, on a public demonstration. So what we did is that te temporarily we shifted uh, to Wi-Fi. We have this technology called uh, in the Philippines um, uh, Piso Net or Piso Wi-Fi, where wherein uh, they have to buy vouchers for time-based um, internet access. So um, the concept is still the same. We still have um, on-premise content in our servers, 
It's just that the delivery is not through LTE, but uh, through Wi-Fi. So you can see our content server, it's in Anuk. Then we have uh, a sort of tower that will uh, deliver the Wi-Fi signal to, uh, to the community. The tower is situated at the school premises uh, for added security. And uh, for because first, first and foremost, uh, the internet connection is, um, is for education. And you can see the captive portal, where in the upper part of the captive portal is your um, uh, voucher um, uh, um, login. And uh, on the bottom side, you can uh, access the uh, on-premise applications that I will uh, discuss later. Next slide. So this is the other technology that uses the digital TV. We call it rural casting. However, uh, our public demonstration on data casting has been on hold. So uh, we then shifted our focus for the meantime to develop the online LMS or the learning management system and an e-library. So the same content um, can be hosted in the Arcas docs. As you can see, it's a full package with a touchscreen and a Wi-Fi hotspot so that other devices could connect to it and access the services inside. Uh, we also developed a super um, cost-effective solution wherein it's just an RPI with a um, that served uh, that serves as a file server for for an e-library. Uh, next slide. So this is a summary of the technologies that we currently have. Uh, so we have the local LTE network, which is not uh, publicly demonstrated but is uh, functionally working on a lab setup. We have the local Fi, which is our Wi-Fi uh, uh, network with um, locally cached content. Uh, we call our um, our video um, uh, repository app local flix. Um, if uh, you can say Netflix and chill, we say local flix and learn. So for rural casting, we have developed this um, setup box. Uh, we call it in the Philippines the TV box. So um, and uh, our LMS, which is a fork of Moodle, um, it's uh, we call it Educast TV. So um, for local Pi, uh, we uh, partnered with our friends from Starlink to provide us um, high-speed um, internet. And uh, just uh, the picture there is a demonstration of uh, local fix in uh, one of the school deployments. Next slide. So um, apart from local flicks, which were videos from our Department of Education, we also hosted Kiwix, which is the offline Wikipedia. Uh, we also ha hosted mathematics appreciation games uh, from a host university, Ateneo de Manila. Uh, we also have Starbucks, which is uh, an acronym for the Science Library of the DOST. We also have the HTML5 apps, which is the virtual tour of the National Museum. And we have um, still um, ongoing um, negotiations to bring uh, technical vocational courses uh, from TESDA, that's our office for technical and vocational courses, so that uh, we could um, tap audiences beyond the students. Okay, next slide. Oops, uh, previous slide. So, um, unfortunately, I cannot play you the video, but um, let's just say that uh, that is a working demo of the uh, rural casting box. We're in, um, uh, it receives a normal TV broadcast, but along the TV broadcast, it has, um, it is saving the PDF file of a quiz later that the students will be answering uh, after the test broadcast. Now for the local file, it should show you a demonstration of the captive portal as soon as you uh, log in uh, in the local file network. Um, next slide. So just um, some, uh, pictures on how to navigate uh, the services, for example, the uh, uh, the virtual galleries of the National Museum, local fix, and Starbucks. Unfortunately, it's on PDF, so um, I cannot show you that. Next slide. So um, currently, we have deployed in around nine school communities across five regions in Luzon Island, um, three of which is in the National Capital Region, and um, uh, 9 minus 3, 6 is outside of the cap, uh, national capital region. So we have deployed in um, uh, two high schools and um, six elementary schools. And uh, out of the nine, um, only four has the internet um, uh, uh, installations. Uh, the other five, uh, we, we, we are able to deploy the rural casting box because in these areas, um, they already have 
um, internet infrastructure, especially those in the um, national capital region. Uh, what we did is that uh, we are we still notice the gaps even if they have the internet connection. So uh, we have um, deployed our our non internet a non internet a non internet based solution, which is the rural casting bus that you have sort of seen earlier. So uh, that is uh, the project reach um, amounting to around uh, 1,500 um, students in uh, Luzon Island in the Philippines. Um, next slide. So here are some pictures on how they are using the um, RAIN uh, uh, R casting box, which is the non-internet based uh, solution. So for the first picture, they are downloading the um, mathematics applications from the math class so they can uh, continue learning uh, using their gadgets. And the other one is uh, they are um, exploring the painting Spoliarium of uh, our national artist uh, during the um, uh, National Arts March here in the Philippines. So they are integrating the, um, the on-cash or on-premise content that we have provided um, in this uh, ARCAS box so that they can integrate it in their learning in their curriculum. Uh, next slide. So um, in Nagway, they are using the um, Starlink internet connection to complement uh, the on-premise applications in uh, hosted in the uh, file server. So um, uh, if they are not using the internet, they are using the uh, videos uh, and the uh, applications that um, are ho locally hosted. Um, they have to control, however, the internet usage because uh, the the situation is that the students are using the internet uh, during uh, school hours and then the adults or the head of households will then go to the school and access the internet uh, during the night time. So they have to establish rules and the for uh, uh, the picture on the right says that uh, 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 you must leave the school premises at 10.30 p.m. So, so that's the uh, gist of that. Uh, um, of that um, notice. So um, there has been use cases for that internet use and there has also been uh, use cases for um, complementary um, on-premise contents uh, to complement the internet use uh, of the school. Next slide. So we also had a, um, a trial of different tower designs. Um, the first tower design is, uh, is, the, is the design that we have inherited from my previous project, uh, the Village Peace Station project. Uh, we then have also design revisions. For example, the picture on the center is a tower situated on top of the school uh, because they don't have um, any land available for, um, for the conventional design. And the picture on the right um, uh, is actually a video of a pneumatic tower so that they could um, erect and um, uh, dismantle the tower um, in, in times of um, emergencies or disasters. Um, it is um, controlled by, by a wind or pneumatic really. So um, uh, they have a, um, what's this, um, air pump source. No? So um, a bicycle pump can actually be used uh, in order to, to erect the tower. Um, next slide. So here in the, uh, the setup of the project is that uh, the project proponents, we the DOST, we provide the equipment uh, training, um, the OPEX, uh, initial OPEX for the test period of uh, this project. However, uh, we are also looking forward to the sustainability of the said program. And uh, we are banking on the school community and the LGU dynamics that we had established. For example, the LGU, um, through a memorandum or agreement, um, has allotted funds and sent us trained personnel for the maintenance. Uh, we also taught them how to um, to uh, to reset the um, the system just in case um, the internet is not working, etc. And um, in one in uh, in one of the installations, um, we have agreed upon a business entity that is within the community that will take over the operations of the system. And we are uh, leveraging on the relations between the uh, local school and the community because uh, once we the project is ended, um, we cannot bank on the education um, focus anymore, but more on a, a much more general uh, community use, right? So uh, we are also um, 
uh, with this, we, we, are, we are utilizing this pilot um, deployments in order for us to uh, to uh, to gather more funds for future deployments and to um, to seek uh, funding opportunities uh, for deployments that uh, are highlighting other uh, sectors, not just education. For example, in disaster risk reduction, wherein the tower can now be placed in the community center and not uh, within the school premises. Uh, tourism sector, wherein um, uh, we can place it in a um, upcoming tourist destination in the Philippines in order to provide uh, connectivity and maybe a source of income then for the uh, for the uh, community that is um, uh, in there. And we also are looking into uh, 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 deploying this in an urban setting uh, for a smart community, for example, or a smart city, as we call it here in the OST. Um, next slide. So in the implementation of um, our education-focused network, which are which we envision to be a community full-fledged community network in the future, we um, we also we are also um, uh, uh, which is um, um, lobbying for these points. In, every time we meet our um, our um, lawmakers, no. So first is the community buy-in uh, because uh, it is important that the community participates in what we do. Uh, and but is sensitive enough for the cap community's capacity to pay. The communities, as we observed, uh, will take care of the network if they feel that they own the network, uh, wherein they reap in the benefits while taking responsibilities uh, for its operation. Uh, we still have to deploy uh, um, a robust and cost-effective hardware and software systems. Uh, we are talking about um, we 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 are talking in the future maybe an open run based systems which promises uh, lower operating costs that may be uh, a, a use case for the open line deployments. I, I don't know, but in the future, maybe. Um, increased participation of government um, through policy reforms that would allow us to um, to perform quasi telco functions, such as uh, important equipment, etc. cetera, and um, ultimately policy reforms uh, that will enable and empower the bottom of strategies and uh, to be sustainable and thrive with conventional players. Um, I think the next would be my last slide. Yeah, that, that is my last slide. So uh, you can follow actually our project in Facebook. We have a Facebook page in order for you to appreciate the deployments that we have. And um, I think that is all. Thank you. Excellent. We now have Q&A. Yeah. Um... Thank you so much, Flip. Uh, I guess we'll be is uh, have a there's a bunch of stuff in the chat, um, but I'll let those folks actually jump into the queue, perhaps as the right mechanism to start a discussion. Of which I th see John has immediately jumped in. So, John, do you want to go first? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. yes. Flip, good to see you again. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the, um, the modems you're using for transmitting over the TV frequencies. What are these things? How are you sending and receiving? Uh, currently, we are uh, using an SDR uh, because it gives us the, the flexibility to, um, to use uh, the specific TV channels that we are, um, uh, we are transmitting in. So um, I'll just jump into the questions in the chat. Uh, the piece of vending machines Wi-Fi, how is it the technology? Basically, you, we are um, uh, during the pandemic, um, some Filipino um, business-minded persons um, uh, connected a um, an RPI or basically a um, which is a, a microtik router in the um, uh, in the modem and added a uh, coin dispenser wherein it could control. Uh, the minutes that you have depending on the um, uh, peso value that uh, you inserted. For example, uh, a five peso uh, coin will give you um, 40 minutes of internet. Um, uh, that is uh, essentially the uh, piece of vending uh, Wi-Fi. So you can do away with the um, coin setup and issue vouchers instead. And that's what we are doing. We are issuing vouchers uh, for the communities the teachers are controlling the amount of vouchers and the teachers are 
um, also using the vouchers themselves. So, other questions? We don't we don't have anyone in the room um, at the mic, Jane. So. Great. Um Philip, I just was curious, could you repeat which frequencies you're using or will be um, allocated? Um, we are advocating for the use of the, um, not the whole 600 megahertz band, but uh, just a portion of it. Maybe in the um, 670 upwards. Cool. Okay, thank you. And somebody did just enter the queue, yeah? We have Rajiv. You want to go? Hi, Philip. Uh, a very interesting uh, presentation that uh, you know you just gave. Like I said, it felt like a lot of deja vu because we've been doing something uh, very similar out in Africa with uh, you know local cash nodes in rural communities with satellite backhaul and the primary use case over there is also education and. Uh, I just wanted to figure out, you guys said that you were using a modified uh, Moodle-based LMS system. Um, yes. So the question that I have there is, um, obviously pairing that with your data casting model allows you to get a lot of the resources that um, normally are included in Moodle courses like PDFs and videos and um, recorded lectures down very efficiently. Um, my question is, have you, uh, thought about contributing any of your changes that you've made to Moodle uh, specific, uh, with specific focus on any changes you've made to have a Moodle setup that efficiently uses a local case? Yeah, um, the team is currently looking into that. Uh, but um, the main R&D or, or the main um, uh, uh, changes that we had uh, uh, since the fork is that uh, we are able to deliver the deltas or just the changes uh, uh, using data casting. So we have we are uh, tracking the differences in the files to, so that constitutes an update. So that is the uh, what that that is that it is that, that is the main feature that uh, we have added uh, to the Moodle fork. And yes, uh, our team is considering to uh, to uh, to. Uh, uh, to um, share it uh, in the uh, back, uh, in the Moodle. Uh, Maybe as an extension that you guys maintain. As an extension, yes. Yeah. OK, looking forward to see more of that. Thank you. Okay, I think we don't have anyone else in the queue. All right, I, I, I want to jump in. I want to jump in. Um, sorry, yeah, I was muted and talking to no one. Um, so Flip and I have uh, worked together for a long time. The previously mentioned project, the Village Base Station project, was one that we worked on together, uh, similarly in Luzon. Um, and I remember so much of the difficulty we had was on that backhaul, that satellite piece. Um, and you mentioned, you know, lightly Starlink as a partner. Uh, how has that been? I feel like um, my own experience has just been how dramatic the shift has been with the arrival of stuff like some of the communities we're in. Uh, so much so that people just, you know, we, like every house in one of our Arctic villages has one. Uh, what has the experience been in uh, rural Philippines in regards to Starlink and your experiences using it as a platform? Yeah. Um, interesting thing is that um, um, uh, maybe Starlink has lowered uh, the uh, subscription costs for um, a household maybe, but we are positioning this project as a way for Starlink to enter uh, green markets wherein uh, we said that um, maybe um, as a household, they cannot afford the uh, monthly subscription, but as a community, they can pitch in the um, needed resources in order for them to uh, continue the subscription of the Starlink. So in a way, if they are not satisfied with the a shared uh, bandwidth that they are experiencing using the community network, then they can subscribe directly to Starlink. So that's what we, uh, that's the pitch that we had made with our partner. So uh, the community networks are um, 
are, are a way to entice uh, future um, uh, subscribers of the Starlink nodes. Yeah. Are, are you Relatively, worried that... Have been... yeah. Sorry, sorry, go, sorry ahead. Curtis. Yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, are you worried that the like most valuable customers will be taken away from the network because they're going to start just grab their own Starlink solution? Yeah, yeah, that is the risk that uh, we are also um, looking at. But uh, be but because um, there are still um, uh, households that are uh, not that affluent to own their uh, uh, old Starlink, that is still um, uh, the main driver on on why these communities can exist because um, uh, they can uh, we, we, they can pay. Um, more, um, not more, but um, uh, they can uh, continue the subscription even without those uh, uh, most affluent um, households. And and um, there is a continued support or there is a common fund from the school that can supplement the subscription. I think. Uh, so, Rajiv, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, feel free to uh, have the discussion uh, in the chat with Flip to continue that. Um, but even with our extra 10 minutes, uh, we, we've, we've run out of time. Um, so next up, we have uh, Ritu. Um, and Ritu is going to uh, speak on CR Bolo here. Uh, you're, you're, you're present, right? Yeah, yeah, I see you standing. OK, go, go for it. Thank you, everyone. And I think and thanks, Jane, for inviting for this con uh, conversation. So the present it's all about to talk about the community radio stations as well as the community networks. As my fellow colleague already mentioned about the community networks. Uh, next slide, please. Am I yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's more yes. to get closer so to I'll just mic. go about what is the landscape of a community radio stations, but primarily I'll tell about what are the community radio stations. Community radio stations are the radio stations which are owned by uh, primarily by uh, civil society organizations as well as committees. So that there are about 44,000 community radio stations across the world. Some of the numbers are here that Philippines and Thailand and India have the largest number of uh, radio stations along with like even like a Nepal, which is a very small country, still have a largest number of radio stations as well. And these radio stations are owned by committee, managed by committee, as well as uh, operated by committee. And they're primarily into the local region where internet is not either not available or a media dark zone areas are there, where not even a newspaper or sometimes it's not coming as well. Similarly, in our community networks, which are right now in operating, which we also call as alternative connectivity models, which are operated in a, around 100 community networks are operating across the world. Some of the countries which have primarily community networks are in are India, Philippines, Thailand, and so many other countries where we have it as well. Uh, <clears throat> before, uh, so the one of the uh, next slide, please. Yes. So why I ha why the community radio stations and why community radio networks are uh, together? Because one of the co uniqueness about the community radio stations that they do have a technical infrastructure such as local server space and a tower and at the height of a tower which can be utilized further for the distribution of the network. So it's not being utilized currently. The most of the radio stations are putting their radio uh, radio. Uh, handsets and transmitter and receivers, but not for the distribution of the connectivity or anyone. So these radio stations are underutilized as per their optimal utilization can be done. Uh, <clears throat> the common the common thing between the radio stations is that they have a, a they understand the local content. They understand the local. Uh, they are able to distribute the local content and produce the local content. That's why they are in within the committee it's, itself. They do have a skilled human resource who can understand the broadcasting, transmitting, and everything. If we do give them an upscale there, they do have an understand. They can also able to manage the network as well. Uh, 
the server space is really important for us because we because in a community networks we talk about the in connectivity with or without the internet when we say the with or without the internet it may uh, may happen that we do not have a backhaul but still the connectivity is maintained through the local network so that the communication is still maintained but maybe the, in, the people are not able to access the internet per se uh, so but these two committee owned institutions are working in isolation in most of the countries and primarily and this is why i took uh, one of the step in india that to put the uh, router and the wireless routers on the radio station and use the height of the tower and the local infrastructure which is available uh, in to set up a com first community radio station in india uh one of the good thing about the radio station is also that they do have a lease line of a internet as per in india they should they should have it at least 10 mbps of a lease line which is completely underutilized because they are using it for uh, uploading the content and so and so forth but not using it further so do they so that's the, another way of utilization of a internet what they already have it uh, uh so, so these are the common attributes for those ones infrastructure technology and license license is the one of the most important thing because in india uh, radio stations do have a right license to uh, broadcast and also they have a sacfa which is a uh, uh, which is a license by, given by the regulatory body to distribute it further in a nearby uh, nearby uh, airports or nearby the isolated areas as well which definitely which certain um, sometimes in uh, isps do need when they are going to distribute the network as well committee engagement is as i said that this is a uh, these uh, these are the things that they are already have it and the skilled human resource next slide please so as uh, the uh, the what the model which i'm saying is as a cr bolo C, cr is a community radio and bolo in english bolo is a hindi word which says that speak and this is the why which we have set up that uh, network it's a cost effective model which is owned by community managed by community and operated by community uh, what we have done in a local infrastructure we have established the wireless network routers which is using a whatever is available uh, whatever is available locally so currently we are using microtech router and ubiquity routers for setting up of a point to point networks we have established around uh, three access points within the circuit, uh, within the radius of a 3 to 5 kilometers of a radio station and then we have connected them the point to point network apart from that we along with that we have created a local network which connects another 5 to uh, seven, uh, 3 to 5 kilometers but we also coupled with it ivr interactive voice response system which is operating on a gsm band as well as on the local network for that purpose we have created our own uh, open source software we uh, use it mojo bowl for the open source software for this ivr setup that's a local page which we have it you can see that the photo is talk about that the radio the tower which we have the first photograph which we have seen it is the radio tower but this is the tower where we this is the kind of a height which we have given to the school uh, where we have used bamboo for setting up the wireless router uh, so this is a kind of a uh, setup which we have done with the communication platform and where we have used all sort of most probably the all sort of a uh, uh, open source uh, platforms such as big Bell, uh, big blue button jellyfin and all sorts of things so that rocket chat so that they can work without the internet as well next slide please uh in a technical infrastructure i have already mentioned that that the what they have done it we have used simple low cost router whatever is available why because procurement is a huge challenge for us of our devices and we cannot afford uh big uh, cisco devices or certain things for our setup of, of the routers so we use whatever is available locally and to maintain locally and to troubleshoot locally uh, we uh, because odisha is a location place where is a, which is a huge heavy rainfall and the electricity goes down so we have backed up by the solar enabled routers we are simply using the 2.4 and 5.8 unlicensed spectrum and uh, for this uh, this uh, uh, for the point to point connectivity and 
as I already mentioned that we are using the communication, different kind of uh, communication platforms for this purpose. Our IVR is also open source. We are not using any kind of a proprietary software as of now because uh, it's not that we are against of a proprietary as of now because we can't afford it for going forward with that. So we are using that kind of a uh, uh, thing. So that's the technical infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. The cost, the what, one of the major thing is that the cost of a setting up of a network, which is a localized network, is really half of the ISP, which is being given in our India. Uh, as you can see, the cost of a setting up of a network is a, around $600 in comparison to a traditional small ISP provider. And I'm not talking about the big telco who is setting up, very small setup of a, a traditional ISP provider who is setting up, that is still the cost is a half of the traditional ISP provider. When we talk about the community networks, we also say that the, it should be managed uh, locally. And so that that's, this is why we train the local people on how to set up the network, uh, what kind of a troubleshooting is required locally, and how to procure the, uh, procure the uh, infrastructure as well as procure the devices and everything else. And this is why one of the social capital which we falls upon the networks is also that uh, you have a skilled human resource, you have a people who those who are man able to manage the network locally, instead of someone who is coming from an urban city and managing the network there itself, because that the cost of a travel is really high on those local people as well. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, this, uh, when we set up a network, we also think about that how this net connectivity can be used meaningfully. So we do provide a different kind of a services, whether it's uh, connecting the nearby local hood, local people. Where it's uh, and uh, uh, the location where I'm right now is a primarily with the fishing community and uh, look, uh, very small level of a people, very small institutions are there. So we try to engage with SHG women's, self-help group women's, and uh, staff members, local NGOs, and the public institutions, which are which could be uh, public health uh, public health uh, care centers or schools. And so currently the connection connectivity is deployed in three schools and two micro enterprises. And this network is used by SHG women to have a converse, to have a conversation and to sell their products locally within that uh, without having going anywhere else so that's the way it, we are we are using it <clears throat> next slide please these are the some of the locations where we have we, the first one is a radio tower certainly it's not it's risky but yes we have to climb up to the certain extent <laughs> to set up the network but this is the another location where we is a school where we have used the bamboo to set up the router and then now we are also exploring bamboo towers to set up a network why because uh, definitely the bamboo is cultivated in in such a coastal region and it is easy to maintain uh, that's why and the cost will go uh, further down for bringing the connectivity next slide please I think the, and this is the one uh, photograph which I have put because here we train the people how to uh, make the network, how to troubleshoot it, and also train them that how to make a small, small thing like a RJ45 connector, which is still a very costly in, in, in such locations. Even cutting, getting a uh, RJ45 is cost, I can tell you that, which I took it from uh, my Delhi location, which cost me around uh, 17 rupees or a 30 rupees there i cost around 100 100 rupees which is around uh two dollars for me so it's a exponentially increase the cost and when we have to buy it so the that's why we may allow make them to make such kind of a play, uh, manage the network and troubleshoot the network locally itself okay uh, next i think that's the, my last slide thank you so much and Your speed demon. Curtis, over to you. Any questions for Ritu? Yeah, I was muted again. There's an interesting discussion in the chat, as usual, which is great. Please use the chat to talk during the talk. Um, but if anyone else wants to jump in to the queue, now would be the time. Shukri has jumped in. Go for it. Sorry, do you have a list of the open source software that you use? 
Yes, I do have it. I think in the previous of one of our slides where I had mentioned that I have used uh, Rocket Chat, Big Blue Button, and some of our uh, open source of uh, uh, applications for the connectivity purpose. So uh, this Mojo Bowl is a local one which we have made it uh, for the IVR software. But Verboys is the one which we have used it, and Jellyfin also we have used for the those ones for the connectivity for the communication purpose. Uh, how many users do you support at a time in the local network? Yes, yeah. so uh, the currently where we are located is a very high densely populated area. It's the uh, radio station is covering around 10,000 population size, but through this network we are su serving around 3,000 uh, population size individuals which we call can call upon. And uh, one at a time there are uh, one at a time we are serving around 20 to 50 people uh, at each location at each access points. So, since our connectivity is going through the school, so primarily the users are students as well as local women, those who use the network. Uh, and it's just to highlight that even if there are traditional ISP providers are there, the cost of connectivity is really high for them. The 1 GB just lasts for a half a day itself. Uh, that is not sufficient for the people. So that's, this is why they needed the connectivity from the other side. Uh, anyone else want to jump in? I have questions to add, but I want to make sure we keep space. I have a question after you, Curtis. I will get in the queue. Um, I think one thing, like having been working in this community network space for a while, one thing that I'm really noticing has been, as you just mentioned, kind of um, more deployments in denser urban areas rather than the kind of rural connectivity that I think drove a lot of at least my research. Um, and so I'm curious about, uh, especially in India, given uh, the variety of low cost providers um, in that market, uh, how this system sort of coexists with, um, with all of that? That's a nice question. I think that the one of the things that in India, you can exist with the uh, high traditional uh, different layers of ISP providers. Why? Because one of the things that ISP providers they do they are there but the connectivity they will provide but the troubleshooting services are really costly once it is down then it is down for a month so that's the way the challenge comes especially in the rural areas the this is the one setup which i have done but the another setup which i'm going to do which is a uh, 100 kilometers from uh, kalahandi district where there's no connectivity no mobile tower and uh, we are uh, you going, not even 2g connectivity so when we are going to set it up, it's I, the, one of the challenge which we are going to face is bringing the backhaul connectivity. But that's what we are trying to bring it through uh, from 20 kilometers away. And this is where when we need our local people to be uh, trained on the ma management and troubleshooting of the network. Why? Because otherwise, if it is down, then it is down for a month. I don't even I can't even say it's a down for a month or a two months as well. It depends upon the uh depends upon the backhaul provider when they will turn up and uh, do that kind of a thing um <clears throat> one of the uh, is that they are, the cost of a connectivity is still a challenge in india despite the fact there's a huge number of mobile internet connectivity uh, because india is a 1.4 billion so any numbers is a huge number but uh, uh, in a reality, in a real sense, the still 20%, 27% of a population is still not connected to the, any sort of a con uh, connectivity. So uh, it's easy to maintain that one. And uh, while being a, uh, located in a local region, managed by the community itself, local people itself, it's easy to maintain because we do have a, uh, connections with the local enterprises. We have a strong hold with the local people and understanding of a local dialect and everything, which helps us out to maintain the network better than the uh, I, uh, traditional ISP providers. Uh, and that's the, uh, that's the way which we work around as well. I hope I have answered your question. 
you two yes, Jane. Um, were there any issues with, um, did you have any opposition from ISPs that might be nearby but not connecting the community? And has the government been supportive? So two part question. So far, I have not. So far, we have not faced opposition from the local ISP providers because, uh, to certain extent, they are also our backhaul providers. So they do support us because uh, they are also they do also have a challenge of acquiring the customers. So some to certain extent, we help them to acquire the customers, or we help them to okay, we uh, set it up. But yes, this particular uh, setup is being used by the district official during the time of a COVID as well as up. up uh, after the COVID, for reaching out to the uh, reaching out to the people on a daily basis, so we do have a support from a local administration. But uh, I'll not say that we do have a financial support. It's the only in-kind support we have. It we don't have any financial support system as of now. Uh, entire thing is managed by community radio station, and they do charge for the services to sustain the network. They charge around. Uh, uh, I think they start in a sense to sustain the network, uh, the cost of a network is coming through the uh, services itself. Cool, okay. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, Ritu, one thing is to connect with Timothy in the chat, who seems to be a very big fan of your work. Um, uh, I think there's actually, I, I, as Timothy is mentioning, a, a good set of Can you hear me? Uh, Curtis, we seem to have lost your audio. Yep, he did. I'll pick up and he'll hopefully join back in a sec. We got a lot of feedback on that mic. Um, uh, I don't know if I can mute Curtis for right now. Okay, welcome to Connectivity Challenges in a fabulous city like Seattle. Um, okay, where Curtis is beaming in at ODARK30. So this is Jane, and thank you very much, Ritu. That was an excellent presentation. Um, Tim Holborn in the chat, or Timothy, I shouldn't shorten your name for you, um, has noted that he's done a lot of work in Australia, and he's seeking to produce local media hubs. And Tim, Ritu, um, everyone here who's presenting, we're going to hit you up for some help later on some best practices for community radio. Okay, Adesorn, it may be you. Uh, Adesorn, can you test your mic, please? Thanks. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Uh, hello. Yeah, the feedback was coming from you. We can hear you. Okay. Should I mute it from now? Well, I think it's better. How does it feel there in the room? Uh, you're up, Adesorn. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there is some feedback if your if your mic is got to get plugged in or not. It's I think um, survivable. Uh, certainly, when you were talking, it wasn't so bad. Um, but if you need a little moment to work on it, we can put John up first as well. Yeah, I agree with Brian. He's saying it sounds fine when there's signal from Addison. If, um, Brian, are you in the room though? Uh, no, I'm I'm remote. Yeah. Also, or dark thirty. The live version of it is particularly. Oh, it's a little feedback here in the room. Okay. Yeah. Sound in the room is fine. We we didn't hear any feedback coming from any mic. Okay, great. All right, uh, I guess then, Adesorn, uh, as long as you're talking, I think you're ready to go. Um, if you hang out, though, it'll probably get loud. So any anyway, uh, we'll stay like that. Uh, is that okay? As long as you're talking, it's okay. Okay, as long as I'm talking, so okay. <laughs> so don't, we're doing the speed, you're not, like, you have to keep talking. <laughs> okay. That's, All right. that's uh, hard. Adesorn, go for it. Okay. So, uh, uh, good morning, everyone from uh, from Thailand, and also should be good afternoon over there. So, my name is Addison Lersin Saptawi, I'm from Interlab AIT. So, uh, it's been such a long time that I haven't been uh, participate to uh, Gaia for a couple of years, I think. Thank you, James and Curtis, that invite me, me in and push me a lot of motivation to come to join Gaia. I will try to be regularly from now. 
and also yeah say hello to all these like john and see uh, sylvia that we have just recently met in epicot bangkok so um okay so the the talk that i'm gonna i think uh, bear with me sylvia i think this is the same slide that i'm, I'm talking on uh, ap star in epicot uh the the talk i'm gonna capture on today is about the our ongoing project is called chsmont which is in the low cost iot platform that we try to monitor the air quality and and develop some kind of model to be the detection of the forest fires, which been the, a huge problem in Thailand in our region for a while. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the, uh, as I mentioned, so the, uh, the outline for my talk is gonna be uh, about T part. The first one is about the production of the projects. And then uh, the second part, is might be related to the Gaia. It's about how we build the community. So, so there we call that IoT community. So, and lastly, I will capture some kind of highlight about our research works on the IoT, PM2.5, and the forest fire that we have been doing for some time. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, to start with, I think we need to uh, do the time machine back to 2016, or where, when, or where, when this the project had been kicked off, started by Ganjana. So actually, uh, this project started about 2016. So this is a news, uh, the headline from the newspaper that we cutting on on the Bangkok Post at that time. So at that time, uh, is the PM2 podcast is quite new for the Thai people. We don't people have not been much know about this kind of uh, this kind we call the silence killer. So people don't know much about this one. And then someday that we after the China break out from the pollution in in, in China meetings, and then people start been aware about the air pollution and this is came up that in the sudden day like uh, the, the air pollution in Bangkok is rising so high and also uh, been the northern part of Thailand as well have been really a uh, dangerous level of like uh, in dangerous level like it's more than like uh, the, the WHO have been accepted so then we uh, please go to the next slide please so we do go out to the source of some statistic, like what could be the source of the PM2.5 that happening at that time. So we found that the majority of the PM2.5 air pollution that have been, uh, been generated in, in our countries is from open burning. So this is cost about more than 50% of the, uh, the, uh, the, the source. So uh, that open burning mean including the two parts of that. So the first one is the forest fire and the second one it's been the open burning from agricultural, also burning some trash as well that been in rural areas. So people are doing this thing a lot, especially uh, during the uh, after the harvest season, people try to burn their coffee to clear some doubt to prepare for the next uh, harvesting season. So this is happening every year, like uh, in uh, from February to May, actually this time of the year. And the second part of the, the source, it came from industry, as you can, uh, like, like uh, the suburban surrounding in Bangkok, we have a lot of industry and factory. So that is another major source cost about 20%, uh, 17% by the industry. And another one being transportation, like car, transportation vehicle, uh, especially in the, in the Bangkok, uh, like the big city. So we have a lot of problem of this one, but later on, so the transportation seems to be better because now we have a lot of change, like for moving from the the diesel car to be the EV car and so on. So this is like kind of a deal things. However, it pushing back to another source like electric electricity generating because now, uh, even though like we you call it EV right, that the how to build that EV uh, batteries and then charging the electricity source is been still generating a lot of pollution as well. So this is why, uh, how we start this project. So please go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and then at that time, uh, we're looking to like, if we want to know about like the status, like what kind of air quality in our area, right? So the, the local source that we found is this, like uh, the air quality stations provided by the, uh, the government agent called Pollution Control Department or PCD in Thailand. And we found that there are some gap and it's kind of uh, information divided between like a big city, small city. So the the uh, the red circle that I highlighted that is like uh, the area it doesn't have the F40 station coming in. 
and then you can see that the down into the Bangkok area. So there are so many dense air quality in, uh, to 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 measure. However, so after the breaking the news, so the headline that I mentioned before, people start looking for oh, what kind of air quality is in my area. So now it is not been the province or regions, but they want to know more in the local source, like a five gain measurement. So and uh, the reason is that the information is not enough. Is that uh, the station that you can see from the figures is very costly. It costs about million baht, more than that, including installations, maintenance, and so on. So, so uh, the solution is that we try to think around, and then what could be a good solution. And then we decided to design and build our own low cost micro sensor to do the five gain measurement in particular area like inside the village, school, hospital, household, national park, farm, etc. So uh, and then also we also have a good support from our past projects as well from the community networks from attack net, net to home. So we have like a people already right to be curious about to to hosting the node and then service it. And we talk about that a little bit later. Okay, please go to the next slide please. Yeah and this is the project that we have been start with in 2016 like uh, lead by uh, Professor Kanchana uh, in the lab AIT. So I haven't joined the project at that time because I'm still uh, away from Thailand at that time. And uh, the project has been funded by the French government. Uh, and also we are partnered up with uh, the French partner, uh, Sorbonne University in Paris. And also we partner with the uh, university in Malaysia and Philippine University of uh, Laos, but not in Philippines as well. So we're forming up a consortium called Kanlin Consortium. The idea is that we want to build the low cost microsensor that could be cheap and that can be scalable to deploy in the 5K measurements. And also we want to provide the real time uh, air quality to the, uh, to the peoples as well. And then the first target locations had been located in the northern part of Thailand in Chiang Rai, which is one of the most polluted area in uh, affected area from the air pollution. Okay, please go to the next slide please. Jane. And this is overall of our platform. So we have the bottom up. The bottom line is about the low cost sensor that I didn't mention that we produce. And then on the cloud side, uh, all the sensor have been sending the data to the to the internet by any kind of sources like we using 4Gs, Wi-Fi from community networks, and also uh, the uh, LoRa as well in in some area that uh, the internet have been have not been connected. And then on the cloud side, we develop our own database and so on, the data visualization that can be in a public for everyone to be in, uh, just checking their air quality in, uh, in, in the areas. And also, we also the providing, uh, we open this platform as well, open data as well, that uh, all researchers that can do analyzing the data, take our data to do analysis. So, so the, uh, the platform is free, so everyone can join. Like this is it, I, I put it two links here. One is hesmon.int.h, and another one is the URL in the local Thai language, Watfun Jut Thai. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of uh, our histories and evolutions. Like being, uh, we started from a very really prototyping one, not look the good one in 2016. So they are put things uh, in the box, uh, like uh, plastic box on that, and then later on we try to improve a little by little. Like from the, two, uh, the first thing that we want to improve, like we need to make this kind of box to be robust and durable. And because the one, the, our target area is we should be in the located in the forest area that we cannot access them much frequently. So uh, the system need to be robust. And then so every time that been uh, something happening, the, we should have some mechanism that been making up the system by themselves. And then little by little, so we also adding more connectivity as well, like LoLa and LTE 4G connection to the to the node, and also making them to be like more sustained with the solar panels and so on. And recently, uh, with uh, last year, we are uh, also joy work with Curtis. So we have a a, a, a couple of nice project called uh, with working with Grab. So we are try to be narrow down build down the the sensor to be a really portable and. And then we are managed to pushing them on the helmet of the uh, the rider. And I can show you that, that later. We more details about that one. Pretty cool one. Okay, please go to the next slide, please. Okay, so at the beginning, 
we have been a lot of criticisms from the uh, the environmental researchers as well right how can we rely or trust the data that have been collected right so we also thinking about that one and then uh, we put this one as a, being a, a top priority for the beginning and then we'll keep doing so until now so uh to 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 answer that question so we're looking around to find some kind of protocol or procedure or standardization to to helping how to testing and calibrate like our sensor so and we also a uh, joint work and then we get uh working collaborating with air pilot which is kind of air pollution control we've been uh, in 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 Paris area and to to helping us to setting up the protocol how we calibrate the sensor and so on so in the, our procedures we separate into two parts the first part is being that we are tested inside the, uh, the laboratories which is been we can control uh, the pollution that we injected to so the uh, the parameter that we have been tested and calibration is on uh, the, the, the particulate matter it's the pm 2.5 and then carbon monoxide CO and carbon dioxide CO2. So we get a lot of help from the KMUTT, which is another university in Thailand, King Mongkut, uh, University of Thonburi. So offer us for the uh, lab pairs and so on. And we also following the, uh, the suggestion from the air pilots as well, how we do the test in the ambient environment. So we get some support from the PCD that allow us to hosting the sensor in the same location, the same at uh, uh, the air forty station, and then we keep collecting data about for a week, uh, for few, uh, uh, five day to seven day, and then we do calibrating and then adjust the the leading data from each sensor before deployment. Okay, uh, can you move on? Okay, now just to be short, so this is about the overview of the projects, right? So now, now we got. The low cost sensor already have been calibrated, and also the uh, the service size on the clouds has been developed. And then another challenge part is that how we deploy them and how we uh, maintain them. So this is the hard, because uh, looking to our capacity with the labs, we don't have much people to do that a lot of deployment. So we kind of borrow the concept of community networks. So and then we call that IoT communities. So to doing so, we uh, can go to the next slide, please. So this is kind of the ecosystem or the model that we are we are doing that. So we consider kind of the community diamonds to uh, to helping us for the deployments and the maintain. So uh, we have some a lot of good and bad experience for giving the new thing to the people. And then at the beginning it should be okay, but after that we know that people might be rejected if we not engage that much. So that's why we are not giving. At the beginning, uh, we're not giving them just the uh, the low cost sensor to deploy, but we let the community push to us like, oh, I uh, in my area we need the air quality. Can you helping us to to give them a donation and so on? So and then we find some funding and to uh, and give them the, the But we have the condition that so if we want to do that, we need to do the trainings. In that trainings, so uh, also I forgot to mention like. The company that we have been working with in this one is came from like uh, can be separated in two parts. This been the first one is local authorities that been gathering about uh, from the forest fire uh, office station that have been located in uh, in in the rural areas and also the uh, municipalities as well. So they want to use like the air quality data just to make a policy like not to go out and then to stop uh, working the, uh, stop the vehicle or something like that. And we also have a strong support from the village as well, which part of them came from the community network people that we have working with in the, in the project, at the Tartnet project. So, so the model is that really simple. So we uh, once we got the demands from the community, so right, we give them the training first, like how uh, how we set up the node and then to make them understand about the IoT. And and uh, like the question, the, because there are so many questions coming up. Like, do this or is safe? Do this or consume a lot of bandwidth? Do this or uh, consume a lot of uh, electricity? So this is really common problems like from the community network. And then we need to give them more understandable about how 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 to do so. And then later on, one day understand the project that we want to do. So we uh, we teach them how to set up departments and then also 
importantly, you know, we, we need to let them know how to maintain the systems as well by themselves. And then as a reward, so they can access to our service, like we're providing them the real-time air quality monitoring that they can access to their lo uh, location, how the air quality look like. And also we are uh, giving them some kind of notifications as well. Like once we found that the area is might leaky or close to the forest fire is been burning, so we send them notifications. Okay, next slide, please. And this is some example that uh, the company that we have been working with. So this committee uh, called uh, the Doi Chang Ba Ba committee. Uh, they are the, the people are being it's been a huge type people called current people. They are who are living in the mountain. Actually, it's about one thousand kilo uh, one thousand uh, one kilometers high from the sea level. So in that area, we there is no electricity, and they, we are do. But luckily, we do have some kind of a partial LTE connection so that we can manage to use, like get the signal, uh, get internet connection from for the 4G router. But, uh, but uh, in some area, they don't have that. We, we, we're using the roller to send uh, the long range transmission system. So uh, actually, this area, me, myself, I just visit them just this year. But this have been built by the community since uh, 2019, uh, 2020, sorry. So actually at that time, it was the COVID, and then we cannot access to that one. So when we start this kind of department, so it's very, very challenging for us because we don't know them. Actually, we haven't met them. We haven't know about the, the locations as well. So we do a lot of like training by online. And then as you can see, the station, the solar station there is what's being designed by the, the, the huge type people, not us. And then they find the material by themselves, like uh, wooden, and, and then we just send them the equipment. Like, and then like the loof that protecting from the rains and then a fence protecting by the animals, they decide by themselves. And then we just visit them like just this year and then just uh, expand some node and then reach them more. So this really a successful story that like we, about four years already, we don't have been there, but then the system still operating on, on by, uh, and then by the committees. Okay, next slide, please. And this is another uh, a committee we call Mapping National Park. So this committee is uh, quite a little bit different from this is from the local authority because we are working with uh, the forest fire officer been working in that area because this area have been suffering a lot about there are so many burning and forest fire and then they need some kind of tools to monitor us like uh, where is the forest fire happening and when and then they can looking to the locations like and then and they can go to the to the to do their operation so in this one the challenging is that there is no internet connection even though the 4g connection so so we decided to develop this our sensor node to be more uh, compatible with the rollers so we're setting up the roller gateways at the police station luckily they have a, a very high tower on there already it's about 35 meters high and then we set up the gateway on top of that. And then that gateway is uh, providing the coverage area. Uh, uh, it's about six to seven kilometers in the light of sight that we can get the signal from, from that. And also, we're also working with another uh, uh, research lab in AIT called AI Center because they are more expertise on the mach uh, uh, machine vision. So we, they're setting up the IP cameras as well to detect uh, the smoke by the visions. And so they like it's two hybrid system. So we have uh, the camera has a, like an eye, digital eyes, and then we have the uh, the sensor the surrounding like a, 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 a digital node to smell some kind of burning and, and fog. So these two are working together to, to detect, like the target is to, to detect the forest fire beforehand. Okay, uh, next one. And this one has been, uh, been located in Tark provinces. It should be in the, the hometown of uh, my mentor, Professor Kanjana. So we are working with like a two home people with THD foundations and also working with the local, uh, uh, lo uh, the political parties as well. So this is some very close to uh, to to this Tark city. So uh, yeah, it's the same idea. So we uh, the this this is quite sim uh, easy for us because the committee knows the text already. Right, they they came from uh, the continent. So this one we just plug in the sensor. So we set up the node really quickly in this area, just about one or two, one or two days. 
because uh, we have been infrastructures already. So the air qualities and IoT has been the service running on top of the, the company net. Okay, uh, next one. And this one, this like really I want to highlight in this one. So this is like our uh, a new project that we have uh, partnered with uh, Curtis from UDAP. And we are also working with the uh, Chiang Mai, a large apartment community in, in Chiang Mai as well. So as I mentioned, so we when we start, actually the project had been running by uh, UDAP, uh, I mean, uh, two years ago, I think. They are looking for the social aspect for the graph people, how they how they've been working with without conditions but and then on our side we have been thinking about air pollution so right? because we know that uh, in like for example in bangkok area so the governors always pushing like when, when we have the high pollution the pm right we have the policy like work from home right don't push the people outside to work just to save your health but we still have a lot of people have been left behind because uh, they have been working like for these kind of people Grab or riders, people, they're working more than 10 hours a day, riding, surrounding, and then they don't have much protection. They can they don't have a chance to be in, be in the buildings. So so they are, the first question that we come up with, so how much exposure that have been asset by them for every day on the day on the daily basis? So and this is a measurement that we uh, we done in uh, in the pilot trial in November. So uh, the campaigns was been set up for seven months, starting from November last year. And then we want to until uh, the end the measurement campaign until May this year, yeah, in order to capture the the air pollution season before the air pollution season in Bangkok is starting around December to uh, to February, and then in Chiang Mai, uh, the air pollution is starting from uh, last month uh, in February until the end of May. So we want to capture some variation like before, during, and after the uh, the the pollution crisis period. So we gathering uh, the volunteer, which is who are running the grab services, and uh, through uh, the riders, so, uh, we got a ten volunteer in total, and then divided in five in, in Bangkok and five in in, in Chiang Mai. So yeah, the thing is that we yeah we uh, on the engineering part, we need to build the sensor to be more lightweight and portable, and not been much been I mean bother them that much. And so that's why we try to building that they adjust the sensor orientation to be like putting them on the helmet of the riders there, and then we keep measuring the the uh, uh the uh, the pollution on that one. So this is the, the heat map that is from one rider that's running uh in one day uh, during the uh, November as I guess. So you can see that they are running a lot. Like uh, we found that the riders has been uh running uh working uh, more than ten hours a day, which is really surprising. And then, then uh, if looking to the, the heat map, the, the color showing the, the concentration of the PM2 power that we capture for each particular location, the, the dark red one showing like more uh, dangerous for the PM2 power part. So we found that even though in November, this is like before the PM seasons, right? We, uh, we found that the exposure that had been accessed by these people it's been four or five times higher than like the station that have been started in, in, in the town. So uh, because they are more moving around, right? And then they have to be outdoors. And then many times they have to be follow uh, the car that have been pushing the pollution just in front of them so that they consume directly from the near source of the, the pollution. So that's the reason that. So we want to keep doing this thing. And then uh, hopefully like uh, after the end of the, the measurement campaign, we could file some really interesting result from that one okay next slide please so and so on so how uh, the the platform look like right now since the so 16th with the help of a lot of people and then comedy uh, uh com iot comedy model that we have been done so we managed to uh expanding not only in thailand we also connected to another partner in southeast a in asia as well like we have the partner in philippines uh, indonesia Laos, vietnam recently in nepal myanmar and also some node in Australia as well. And more than 200 nodes have been uh, deployed and then it's still active to keep recording the real-time air quality. And uh, the apart from that, we also benefit from a lot of data that we have. So here, this is some example of uh, the, the data that have been collected. We have so many use cases. The first one has been the forest fire that has been uh, the, the, the objective of our work. And we also have a data in the rural areas as well, like in the school, hospital, 
and we have the mobile air quality with the, the riders and we have the data from the, the sensor in the downtown, the Bangkok near the roadside unit. And we also are curious about the, the use cases that uh, the, the vertical measurements, like we have some idea like people who live in a high rise building like a condominiums. So in different form, they should have a different uh, patterns like, because uh, not only the PM is going horizontally, but they should be going in, in vertical lines as well. So with the, the sensor are cheap and then low cost and portable. So we can manage to deploy them like as a stack in the vertical stack. And of course, we're also looking to the farming side as well because they are uh, another major source of the burning is from the agricultural and farming. So we have a lot of open data and then so we are looking for, uh, we also high, uh, have a lot of intern students or internship or researcher to join us. And then we do analysis, provide them the consultants on, on doing this research as well. So if you are interested about our data, just feel free to drop me an email. So we have a bunch of data and then waiting for the data science and data analytic people. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, and then my last part of talk is about to just to highlight about our ongoing research on the forest fire detections and then how we can start hacking them. So this is like uh, our main goal. So please go to the next one. So uh, as I mentioned, so the uh, when we start the project, right, we want to, apart from providing the uh, the, uh, the real time air quality measurements, we also want to use this kind of a low cost sensor, which uh, been a more like a more distributed uh, to de to de detect the forest fire beforehand. So because uh, the be the benefit of the IoT sensor is it's cheap and low cost, we can deploy them in many area, and then we can use a powerful of many nodes and then the in in particular one and do some modeling. So we start from looking to the data uh, in 2021 from January to May in the Tax province areas. So in that area, so at that at that time. So we, uh, during the five months period of 2021, we found that they have about a hotspot. If you don't know about hotspot, this mean, uh, it means uh, the, the area where they take by the satellite to be like, the area has been more likely has been burning in that area. So we have about more than 2,500 hotspots in, in that particular area. And then so from the report, from the, we found that almost, 2,000 square kilometers have been burnt, damaged by the forest fire during the five months period. So this is we've been suffering a lot from this kind of burning. So in our study, so we have about 25 air quality sensors that keep monitoring and uh, measuring the, the particulate metal, PM1, PM2, PM10, and carbon monoxide which, and CO2. This is kind of parameter that related to the burnings. And we have collecting the humidity, temperatures, and air pressures as well. And we also have a three weather station that collecting the wind direction and speed in, in the area because to understand like the the plumes or the haze of the pollution can be moved from one location to the other by the wind effect. So next slide, please. And uh, to start the analysis, why we need to identify first because during the five month, which period is burned and which period is not burned to be trained the model understand like okay this kind of pattern is been so we use the okay so we use the the hotspot data from the satellite and then uh, navigate on the location on the on the, on the left photo uh, or navigate that which location which location have been burned and then in the times so, so and then we manage to identify the three periods of burn and non period non burned period and then we use the data for analysis right and then therefore analysis I from the many parameters that we found, we found two dominant parameters is been the PM2.5 that being collected and also the carbon monoxide that uh, has been really highly correlation to the burnings uh, period. Okay, please, uh, next one. And okay, uh, then we managed to really uh, uh, come up with the simple decision tree model uh, the work has been published already uh, in the last uh, December. So if you have, I think we, I don't have much time to go for this one. So uh, I just, just skip this one and then you have more detail. You can just searching our paper. So uh, then uh, next one. So once we got the models, right? So we uh, uh, we do the deployment. So we cannot do the same year because we have to wait until the, the, the burning season. And then we, uh, we start the evaluations in 2022. 
uh, we are uh, we push the models in the cloud and then we detect monitors the uh, the PM levels and see uh, carbon monoxide levels right and then once we detect like it's the suspects to be the, the burnings right we send them notification to the forest fire officers so this is uh, and this is some example that we found that like on the fifth appeal two years ago so we managed to send them warning the message like continuously like uh, the burning should be come up and then uh, the people just looking to the and then found that the uh, the burnings is not far about uh, three to five kilometers far from the the sensor location so next one please and and but uh actually the problem is that means uh we have too much fog positive and then one of the uh, the key thing is that we found that the humidity is being one of the uh, the the key factor because with the limitation of the, the PM sensor, they cannot identify between the fox mist after the rains and also uh, the plumes of the PM because they are the technique that they use are very really limited. And that's why we are curious about that. And then we decided to put the cameras into the mountain just to, to watching them. And then we found that someday it's been raining a lot and then we still like sending the notification to them. So try to avoid this thing. And then another thing that we found that the sensor behavior been uh, a bit delayed as well. Like for this example, we found out uh, we sending the notifications about uh, about twelve at noon. But actually, from the camera, we can see some spot from the camera since the night. So we have about three hour delay from that. So now we want to try to improve the model and the accuracy as well in that sense. Okay, next one, please. And uh, this is like our uh, recently uh, research work that we have been doing now. So we want to uh, working on this one. So from the two years evaluation, so we found that uh, apart from the humidity and then the delay, we also another problem that we found is like uh, when the plume is coming in, right? So all the sensor detect at the, almost at the same time. And we cannot identify where is the source because the plume is moving so fast because of the wind effect. So that's why we are working with uh, the uh, since we have many sensors in the area, so we want to do like doing some kind of sharing data, getting the data from one to the others, and then to do the computation on that. And we want to tracing back like which locations being the originators, origins of the find. So this is the, the event that we have been detected uh, on uh, uh, three weeks uh, uh, last month in February. So we try to tracing back which is being the local source of this burning area. And then we identify them with the other hotspot. We found that the local source is one from north, 126. And then not far from them, we found that like they, this has been hotspot. This uh, by uh, the, the, uh, apart from the hotspot that we detected, we also do have like a site surveys as well. Diving, uh, we have a local people diving there uh, to take a photo and then to validate them as well. So and Adesorn, we only have two minutes left for questions. So I yeah, um, I think I'm yeah. done with this one. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next, thank you. Next slide should be uh, the last one for my side. Okay. Yeah, this is yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Great. Over to you, Curtis. Yeah, I see Alexander has jumped in. Go for it. That's an in-person. My question is about the sensors you use to get the air quality data. Do they rely on proprietary software to spit out the final results, or do you have your own implementations of the processing pipeline? I think I lose some uh, some word from, from your wife, because uh, you, you mentioned about proprietary something, but I could not catch that word. OK, I will repeat. Uh, yeah. What sensors do you use to get the air quality data? OK, so actually, we. Uh, we haven't built our sensor by them. So we're looking to the sensor that have been available, low cost sensor available in the market. So they have some, and then uh, we get recommendation from the companies of which one is quite reliable. But actually the one that we use is called uh, from the one from Pan Towers, uh, which has been the, uh, quite uh, widely used in, in, in the community for this one. Okay, thanks. And, uh, Flip is mentioning that uh, the Philippines has a similar problem space. Yes, uh, it was actually an earlier phrase of this of this grant. We had focused on that, but um, there's no motorcycle taxis in uh, Bangkok or in. Uh, yeah, we we have been talked to the our uh, Philippines uh, friends as well. Like 
and then we 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 want to deploy some more measurements right because uh, in Philippines in Manila so we heard that so you have some problem with jeepneys the jeepney car I mean the like, big old uh, by uh, the, the the local transportation so right? we want to do some kind of things right pushing like measurements on that jeepney cars as well similar to the one we put in the rider so but we are we still uh, working on that one that that uh, project to try to deploy them somehow cool Okay, uh, thank you so much, Adesorn. That's, of course, amazing work. Um, and uh, we're out of time, so um, if there's any other questions, please uh, ask those in the chat so we continue side discussion. Um, can we mute Adesorn if there's the background noise? There we go, perfect. Uh, and uh, I just want to mention Benson uh, in chat mentioned that the similar situation with motorcycle taxis in Africa. Yes, there's a wonderful group at McCrary actually doing very similar work. Um, the air quality sensing problems are different because um, it's not so much burns as it is like dust uh, and motorcycle pollution, um, but a, an interesting spot uh, and, and trade off spaces anyway. Um, so we'll move that to the chat. But otherwise, John, our, our, uh, our final speaker here, uh, feel free to go. Hello. So, um, Jonathan Brewer here, and um, I'm going to talk about um, New Zealand's 3.3 gigahertz managed spectrum park. Um, how do I advance the slides? I just wait for Jane to advance them. Is that how this works? Just uh, give Excellent. me a cue and I'll do it. Yep. Perfect. All right. So, what's a managed spectrum park? Um, it's a concept that was um, agreed by uh, regulators and parliament in uh, or, or cabinet in 2007, implemented in 2010. It's a government managed spectrum right, not one that's been sold off to a carrier, um, where the government can enter into license agreements with local and regional um, providers, internet service providers, um, to, uh, to give them the right to use spectrum that normally would be only for a cellular operator. So the first spectrum that was released was um, from 2580 to 2620, and that's um, LTE band 41. Um, there were relatively strict acquisition limits. Um, you could only take uh, maybe five or seven small geographic areas and they had to be contiguous. So you weren't allowed to look at New Zealand and just pick the big cities. You could pick the big city and the region around it um, but you couldn't just say, I want to pick the five biggest cities in New Zealand and take a little bit of spectrum in each of those. Um, that, that was uh, against the rules. Uh, so strict utilization rules in that you had to deploy a working network um, and show that it was in use within two years of taking your allocation um, or seed the spectrum back to the government. Um, another um, Part of this managed spectrum park was the idea that um, park users, uh, operators within the spectrum park are supposed to cooperate. And um, this didn't always happen. And so in uh, 2021, um, the park was closed to new applicants. Now that doesn't mean that existing users have had to stop or shut down their networks. Existing users continue on, but uh, no new users have been allowed into this spectrum uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, and our government really hasn't told us when that's going to change. Uh, ne next slide, please. So um, because this 2.6 gigahertz park was um, shut down, providers in New Zealand, wireless ISPs, especially those serving rural and remote uh, areas, uh, still needed more spectrum than just 5 gigahertz. And because um, local and regional use of three gigahertz is present in a lot of markets in the world, uh, most popularly in the US where it's known as CBRS or Citizens Band Radio Service. Um, and because um, the 3.3 .3 to 3.8 gigahertz radio band was in the process of being replanned in New Zealand for use uh, for 5G, um, the government partitioned the band into blocks and they left the bottom 110 megahertz of this allocation for local and regional use. Um, inside of that local and regional use band, they took the bottom 40 megahertz and turned that into a managed spectrum park. Next slide, please. So 
the band has a lot of points of contention between the mobile operators and the wireless ISPs. Uh, and in New Zealand, there are around 30 active wireless ISPs, each of whom has between a few hundred and a few thousand subscribers. The, the smallest are around the um, 100 to 200 mark, and the largest are, are coming close to 10,000 subscribers on their own access networks. Um, so the mobile network operators thought that the entirety of 3.3 to 3.8 gigahertz should be used for 5G with a TDD, a time division duplex timing configuration, um, very particular to 5G that would only support transmissions in a nine kilometer cell radius. Now, if we're talking about rural and remote sites, um, nine kilometers doesn't get you far. It's great for suburban use and urban use. It's actually quite big for urban use, but it's good for suburban use, exurban use, but it's not good for rural and remote, especially in parts of New Zealand who have um, one to five people per square kilometer um, li living across the regions. So the local and regional providers um, weren't interested in 5G. Uh, they really wanted to use LTE um, and they wanted to use it in a configuration that would allow them to broadcast 32 kilometers from their tower out to their furthest subscriber. Uh, and also um, the local providers wanted the spectrum anywhere um, above 3.4 gigahertz, but not really at the bottom of the allocation. And I think the next slide will kind of explain that. Yeah, so, so here's the whole band. And I've um, noted some LTE bands, band 52, um, band 42 and 43, which are both very popular around the world, and uh, the United States uh, CBRS band, which is LTE band 48. And uh, I've also noted um, the 5G new radio band. So this is the, the 5G that is most commonly deployed around the world now for, uh, for urban areas. Um, it ranges from 3.3 to 3.8 gigahertz. Okay, next slide. So a little digression here. <clears throat> and um, this is a point where I have a strong disagreement with New Zealand's regulator. Um, who believe that 4G is end of life and that uh, operators should only be deploying 5G. Um, now in my work throughout the region, I'm still advocating for 4G and new 4G deployments uh, because it's my perspective that um, new 4G equipment will continue to be developed until around uh, 2030 and continue to be installed. Um, and we do still see uh, development of 4G significantly uh, in small cells and low power, uh, low cost equipment. So we're starting to see a, a lot of interesting new equipment available using very low power uh, at very low cost. Um, so if we look at the operational lifetime of the previous generations of technology, um, 2G was still being deployed until about 2015. And um, a lot of markets won't shut off their 2G. I mean, some of them have planned to shut it off in 2025, and some of them um, will just keep going with it probably until 2030. Um, 3G is um, kind of baked in uh, to the world. I was just discussing with a journalist in New Zealand, a very wealthy market. Um, there are still uh, 55,000 um, handsets on one of the networks that are 3G only. So, um, so there are a lot of people in wealthy markets using 3G. And if you look to Africa, um, there are a huge amount of 3G only phones there. Uh, and some carriers in Africa are, are continuing to build new 3G sites even this year. So I, I think that 4G is uh, a valid technology choice for building um, rural and remote networks today and still will be for another few years. Uh, ne next slide, please. So here's the bone of contention. The bone of contention has to do with time division duplex synchronization. And this is really arcane, um, but bear with me for a moment. Um, LTE has uh, 10 millisecond long um, patterns where, uh, sorry, has, has five, uh, can be configured as five millisecond long patterns. And across the top of this colorful chart here, we have um, two frames, um, two five millisecond frames here. Uh, we have a download frame, a special frame, which is a mix of download 
pause and upload traffic. We have an upload frame, we have another download frame, and we have another download frame. And then we start the cycle over again. Uh, we have another five milliseconds where we have a download, a special, an upload, a download, and a download. Um, that special frame, how you configure that determines your cell radius. Uh, because in TDD communications, you need to stop sending your data towards your subscribers and wait for a, a little bit until the waves actually physically have enough time to get to your subscribers and they have time to start uh, uh, transmitting back to you. So there's a little pause um, uh, in there to, to keep things synchronized. Anyway, it's possible for um, 5G, which is a technology that has a, uh, can have a two and a half millisecond or a five millisecond alignment. Um, it's possible for 5G to synchronize with 4G if 5G has a five millisecond frame alignment. Um, and it's also possible if um, 5G is set for two and a half milliseconds, then it, it won't synchronize at all. And so um, I have three different options for configuring your networks here across the top. And the one that New Zealand's government has chosen is the one at the very bottom, which um, actually has conflicts between download traffic and upload traffic between 4G and 5G. If you have a conflict like this and you've got two operators next to each other, um, maybe you know geographically adjacent, say within 30 or 50 kilometers, they'll interfere with each other. Um, if you have them geographically uh, co-located, like on the same tower, but on different frequencies, um, if the frequencies are adjacent to each other, these networks will interfere with each other. So uh, it's, a, it's really not ideal to have um, a different uh, configuration, different TDD configuration between two technologies that are in the same um, spectrum block. So um, ne next slide. That's, that's the really technical part. So back to this whole LTE thing. Um, there are a lot of networks in this world that are still running LTE in um, a three gigahertz band. And as a result, when operators are deploying five gigahertz in the three gigahertz, uh, when they're deploying 5G in the three gigahertz frequency band, they're doing it in a compatibility mode so that they don't interfere with their neighbors. Um, in Europe, this is uh, an exceptionally difficult task uh, because the borders, the countries are so small and the borders are often shared between lots of different countries. So cooperating with your neighbors is super important. Anyway, we see um, lots of countries doing um, band 42, lots of countries doing band 43, and then the USA um, kind of spanning the two uh, with band 48. And, and the US is um, uh, important here because a lot of the equipment for um, small uh, networks for, for wireless ISPs uh, is meant for the US market. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. And then we have markets with LTE in the 3.3 to 3.4 gigahertz band. Uh, it used to be China uh, with band 52. And today it's none because China has repurposed their band 52 uh, into uh, 5G. Next. So what sort of equipment can we get for LTE in 3 gigahertz band? You can get transmitters that cost as little as $600. You can probably get them cheaper now. Um, you can make LTE transmitters out of software-defined radios. Um, you can get them from low-cost uh, manufacturers like buy cells. Uh, you can get them from specialist companies like Blink or Cable Free. Um, uh, yeah, there's a whole list of them here. And of course, you can get them from traditional providers. My list down here uh, is just aimed at wireless ISPs. Of course, in addition to these um, manufacturers, you're going to have Nokia and Ericsson and Samsung uh, and NEC uh, also making 4G equipment uh, for band 42, band 43, band 48. Um, but uh, yeah, the key, key is that you can get very low power equipment uh, and your transmitters are, are very inexpensive. Next slide. So let's talk about, oh yeah. So LT equipment for band 52, there's one option. Uh, and that's a company called Telrad, uh, an Israeli company. They make very nice LTE equipment, but um, it's very expensive and it takes a lot of power. Uh, and I know um, if you have any experience with solar power, well, 
Edisorn was showing those those IoT stations uh, in uh, on the, the border of Chiang Mai uh, province there. Those solar panels above his um, uh, his IoT stations were like 20 watt solar panels. Um, if you've got a 200 watt uh, LTE installation, you really need to have uh, at least 1500, maybe close to 2000 watts of electricity to um, be able to collect enough to put it in batteries and store through nighttime and periods of cloud and rain and so on. So it's no small feat to provide 200 watts of uh, continuous power to an LTE installation. Next slide. And then we get to 5G equipment and 5G equipment is even more expensive. And um, I've listed the cheapest um, 5G transmitter that I know about, which is an American company called Wifrost who um, are famous for, for making TV white space equipment. Uh, and Wifrost um, have just uh, increased their product range from TV white space and LTE and TV white space uh, to carrying 5G. Um, their lowest power units take around 300 watts and their lowest cost transmitter is $1,400 per sector. So a two or three sector site um, is once you've added your power system and and everything else is probably going to be eighty or a hundred thousand U.S. dollars. It's it's just out of proportion for providing to areas that have uh, th that's fourteen thousand. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you for the question in the, in the um, uh, chat. So it's fourteen thousand dollars, and yes, it's out of proportion for providing to a rural area which may only have a few hundred people. Next slide. Now there is one other option um, that is a uh, TDD wireless equipment that can synchronize with 5G, but is not 5G compatible. Uh, and a company called Cambium has a uh, product called the 450i that uh, is around a thousand US dollars, um, consumes only 18 watts, doesn't have a huge amount of throughput, but uh, you can configure it for two and a half millisecond frames, which means that you can deploy it on the same tower as 5G um, in an adjacent band. You can deploy it um, uh, within range of a, uh, another 5G system without uh, interfering with it and without being interfered with. Next slide. So now we're gonna go on to the rules of our um, three and a half gigahertz managed spectrum park. Um, just like in the 2.6 gigahertz park, it's regional and non-national. There are acquisition limits. Uh, this time around, we have population-based utilization fees. So if you take a, um, a license in an area that has uh, only a few hundred people, um, you're going to pay a fixed fee per transmitter, which is less than $100 a year. And then you're going to pay a variable fee based on the population. And that variable fee is going to be a few pennies per user per year. Uh, if you're taking the spectrum in Auckland, where you have a million people, well, those few pennies add up. But if you're taking the spectrum in a rural area um, that has a thousand people, you're not going to notice the fees. Uh, so population-based utilization fees, not a bad idea. Um, there is a two-year implementation uh, requirement. If you don't implement within two years, you lose your right. Um, your uh, cells can only be uh, configured for 30 kilometers. There is no requirement for synchronization. So you don't have to use 4G or 5G. You don't have to be synchronized with your neighbors. And um, uh, this is why um, providers have been limited to 3,300 to 34. 340 megahertz, only 40 megahertz of the 110 set aside for local and regional use. Um, they want to keep uh, providers who may be using an unsynchronized technology uh, separated from providers using 5G by, uh, well, in, in this case, um, 70 megahertz. Um, so so this, this is kind of the, the penalty for um, allowing the use of a non-synchronized technology in a synchronized band is that you need to have a separation uh, between channels. And in this case, the, the regulator has chosen 70 megahertz. Um, and there was a complicated process for initial access, but I'm 
too complicated. Next slide, please. So engineering of these licenses, um, in New Zealand, engineering is outsourced to private individuals. Um, the government uh, approves radio engineers and radio engineers are allowed to write licenses into the registry of radio frequencies um, that are then uh, signed off by uh, the regulator and put into force. Um, in practice, there are only two engineers participating in this spectrum band um, because it is turned out to be very difficult. Um, so what happens when you um, want to engineer for this band? Well, first you have to predict your coverage. You have to define your coverage area. You have to make sure that your new coverage license is not going to interfere with um, any existing license. Uh, and then you need to write that license to the register of radio frequencies. So I'll show the, those steps in the next slides. Here we're doing a, a coverage prediction. And um, in this case, the radio is a Cambium 450M, which broadcasts at uh, around four watts before uh, antenna gain. Um, so the effective radiated power is probably closer to 200 watts. The subscriber units are small dishes. They're um, 400 uh, millimeter dishes, and um, they have a gain of 20 dBi. Uh, and a transmit power of around um, uh, 20 watts after antenna gain. This is all licensed, so we get a lot more power to work with uh, than you do in unlicensed communications. So here's our, our coverage prediction, and go on to the next slide. Um, I have to take that and, at the moment, manually define a coverage shape, shape file to upload to the register. It has to be manual because um, I tried um, making automated shapes and the first shapes i came up with the regulator said these are not comp not complicated enough they're not showing the contours and the terrain uh, and then the next go i had with automated shape creation was these shapes are too complicated you've given us so many vertices on these polygons that our system can't even store it um, can you please give us a polygon that has uh, no more than 300 vertices and i said okay well then fine i'll just do it manually Next, that's then that's what we come up with. Next slide. Next, after that, you upload this um, license to the register of radio frequencies. You could go in via a website and click hundreds and hundreds of times and type in um, all of the points of um, all of these um, uh, polygons and all of the various license parameters, or you can use their API. Um, I've chosen to use their API because I would find it impossible otherwise. Uh, and so you, you write the license via API and then it, it gets stuck in there. Next slide. Uh, once the license is registered, um, it's available for public viewing. So anybody in the world can jump on into this website and look up the license that I'm showing. Um, and basic parameters are recorded like the operator of the license and when it was effective from um, and uh, what its um, service radius is how many square kilometers it's covering, in this case, 871 square kilometers for a radius of 29K. Uh, and um, we'll see a bit more in the next slide. Um, we can see the radiation pattern from the antenna. So we've got our horizontal radiation pattern and our vertical radiation pattern um, there on the left. And the um, I think that chart is just showing us uh, um, dB watts, decibel watts of power emitted. And so we can see in this case, the bulk of our power is being emitted to the Northwest and um, with a down tilt um, that looks biased towards around five degrees. Uh, most of the, uh, the radiated energy is um, between zero and around minus 10 degrees. So we've got a good down tilt. We're up on a mountain, we're tilting down. Next slide. And uh, you can look at and see my, my beautiful shape that I drew in the register of radio frequencies also. Next slide. So I, I think this is like the last slide even. So this is what it looks like when you've deployed it. And uh, this is um, three different sites. There's two of, of the same in one photo and, um, and two different ones in the other photo. Uh, in all cases here, we have the um, 
Cambium 450M, which is an 8x8 MIMO radio. This guy takes around 100 watts of electricity. Um, these sites, the sites on the left are mains powered sites. The site on the right actually has a huge bank of solar panels. Um, the site on the right is in a very sunny region called Nelson uh, and, uh, and never has any problems with sun. Um, but the, uh, the sites on the left uh, yeah, they get cold and dark in the winter and they get snowed on, so, so they have mains power. Anyway, very um, quite low cost um, for the uh, amount of throughput that you're getting. This radio is capable of 800 megabits per second of capacity. Um, the providers I worked with um, in engineering this have them configured for 600 megabits per second down, 200 megabits per second up. And they're uh, typically loading a maximum of 80 um, subscribers uh, sharing that bandwidth. So, um, that, um, Jane, is that my last slide? Oh, no. Okay. I, I also um, I, I gave you, Adasorn, this is my lying Buddha impression, uh, re reclining Buddha impression of New Zealand. Um, so, I've, I've, I've just, you know, til tilted it over so that, so that he's, yeah. Anyway, um, th this is all of the licenses, and uh, I've taken these licenses from the registry of radio frequencies via API. So I've done an API query, um, and then I'm just um, drawing the shape files um, in Python and making a KML. So um, in a six-month period, when we were able to register licenses in this managed spectrum park, um, we had more than 20 ISPs participating, and as you can see, they covered quite huge amounts of um, rural New Zealand uh, with virtually no, no coverage in the big cities like Wellington and Christchurch and Dunedin and Vicargill. There's no coverage there, um, but, but lots of coverage in, um, in areas with, with large rural populations. Anything else, Jane? That's it. All right, Good so we're well, done, but uh, any questions left? Any, uh, any questions from the audience? Yep. Thank you so much, John. Um, questions, please get into the queue. Might have been a bit much. <laughs> it was I a five. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Has something to ask. Go ahead. I am at a loss as to why you would just give the whole spectrum to 5G for the providers. Why this part on something? What, what is um, it buying? Okay, the, the providers have chosen a 5G technology that has a cell radius of nine kilometers. This means that it's not economic for the major providers to deploy 5G outside of population densities of fewer than say 100 people per square kilometer. Um, 5G in New Zealand is only going to be deployed in cities and towns. Um, there's no way that in this frequency band 5g will be deployed in most of the areas where these rural and remote providers are giving service um, the rural and remote providers need the spectrum because the five gigahertz band which is open is highly congested in these areas thank you you're welcome Yes. We have time for a fast question. Yeah, one one more before we're out of time. I have a bunch of stuff I'm going to message John about afterwards because I got very yeah. confused. But um, oh, Brian, go ahead. It's on me. Brian, go ahead. All right, let me. Am I unmuted? Can people hear me? Yes, yeah. you can hear you. Go ahead. Excellent. Hi. Cool. Hi, Jonathan. How's it going? Uh, great Thank talk. You. Very interesting stuff. Um, I'm going to ask a short rambling question that basically tries to tie together two things here. So all of these providers, or all of these licenses are basically to relatively small rural ISPs, correct? So these are, are small rural. So this is sort of in that CapEx band of, of tens to hundreds of thousands of New Zealand dollars to do a deployment. It, 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 even tens. Uh, ten, tens of thousands of U.S. dollars for a deployment. Some of these deployments will be under $10,000. Some of them okay. will be under $5,000. Got it. 
Okay, so we really are starting to get into this band where like you could have community network operators playing in this space, right? Like so earlier we saw talks about like CapEx in the hundreds to low thousands of US dollars for um, community radio providers doing um, doing this sort of stuff. Has there been any overlap of like community radio in rural areas in New Zealand operating these networks or is it still is there still too much of a band gap in the in the um, capital expenditure here? It, it's more the case that um, uh, some uh, private community radio operators got into wireless uh, internet as a side business. So there is an okay. overlap, um, but, uh, but community radio in New Zealand is so free and open that individuals can start broadcasting uh, with, with on a shoestring. Okay. So it really is that, that, that the community radio is, is just cheaper relative to the rest of the economy there than it would be in a place like India. It's very, very okay. inexpensive here. Okay, cool. Nice. Awesome. Thank you very Good much. To see you again. And I think we're out of time. Yep, we are officially at time now. Thank you all for coming to join. I posted in the chat the Gaia mailing list. Everyone should uh, jump on that. Um, and for the next IETF in Vancouver, which is delightfully close to me, um, you, anyone can come and meet me in person. I will be attending. Um, if anyone has any talks they'd like to give, of course, reach out to Jane and I. Our current plan is for two talks plus a panel on Leos because we think we can get some Leo folks to come out to Vancouver. So also, if you have interesting points or people on the Leo space that you think would make uh, good panel participants for Gaia, similarly, reach out to Jane and I. Otherwise, thank you so much to the speakers. This worked out fantastically. Um, I feel like we had exactly the right amount of uh, speaking and questioning and discussing. Um, and we will see you all next time. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Sylvia and Ritu, to man the yes, table. Thank you so much to Sylvia, who <laughs> managed Brisbane, and I could not make it to Brisbane. It was too Thank you, guys. Be well, all. Thank you so thank much. You. Well done. I took some photos. I will share them with you later. Thank you.